Welcome everyone, nice to see everyone. Okay, so good evening once again to you all. A, a very warm welcome to all of our intellectuals and thinkers and also to our friends from the IPATC in South Africa. It's great to have you here with us once again as we officially reach the halfway stage of our series and of our Pan-African Pantheon lectures. If you're here for the first time, I just wanna give you a special welcome and warm greetings from London. As is tradition, if you're here for the first time, it's customary to just tell us where you're logging in from in the chat. If you could let us know your name and your location, just as everyone gets settled, that would be much appreciated. So just gonna have a look at the chat now. You wanna let us know where you're coming from? So we've got Nigel in Hitchin, welcome Nigel. Who else do we have? Where are we logging in from? Sonia from Brighton, welcome Sonia. Got Pearl from Boston, amazing, and in London, welcome. Lovely to have you here. Got anyone else? Jason in Warwick, welcome. Okay, we've got from the IPATC Johannesburg, Charmaine in London, Eaton Berlin, lots of people. Uh, I'm from London, so I'm, I'm uh, logging in from London at the moment. Papeki uh, in Kent, welcome, nice to see you here. Rahima in South Africa, Lee from New York. Okay, so we are truly global this evening. That is wonderful. So on behalf of everyone at the Center of Pan-African Thought and the Institute of Pan-African Thought and Conversation, we just want to say it's a pleasure to have you here. And I hope that you leave tonight's lecture with the information and knowledge that you came for. So let's start. Hopefully we're all locked in and comfortable. I am personally really looking forward to tonight. I heard that the conversation got very deep last week and I'm like you hoping for much more of the same this evening. As many of you already know, my name is Akaita Alfred and I'm your host and your moderator for this wonderful series. First thing I just wanna say is my apologies for being absent last week. I heard Apeki did a stellar job in standing in for me and I'd just like to thank her for being able to do that at what was quite short notice. So she'll be back for the next couple of weeks after today before I then return to take us down the home stretch during mid to late August and September. So tonight, as I said, is the fifth installment now of the Pan-African Pantheon Lecture Series, the series that takes a critical look at some of the prophets, the poets and philosophers of Pan-Africanism. It's a celebration of some of the most influential thinkers and leaders of the Pan-African movement and will probably go down as one of the most comprehensive series on Pan-African thought and African cultural and political thought that we've seen for a long time. It's a celebration of this wonderful book, The Pan-African Pantheon, by 38 scholars from around the world that has been edited by our comrade and friend, Adeke Adebajo. The aim of these sessions is for us to reflect on, to evaluate, and to reassert our commitment to Pan-Africanism not just as citizens on the continent or members of the diaspora, but as a global African family, unifying intellectually to consecrate our desire to see the foundations for a new Africa, an Africa that's safe, self-sufficient and prosperous for her people. If we want a new Africa, the one thing I'm sure of is that we need a new African in the world. And that comes from education, it comes from learning histories, and from recontextualizing our inherited greatness so that we can overcome today's local and global challenges. Some would say that that spirit and that greatness was embodied in the man that we're going to discuss tonight, Marcus Messiah Garvey. He is a man that is widely heralded and revered in most Pan-African circles, but he's also a man that I personally find deeply complex and quite mysterious. That is why in the lead up to his birthday, would have been his 134th to be specific on August the 17th, to unpack his life and his legacy, we have one of the UK's finest historians and scholars. But before I introduce our wonderful speaker for the evening, I just want you to tell me in the chat first, what is your own personal view on the legacy of Marcus Garvey? Would you say on the one hand, a flawed, fairly pig-headed idealist, whose utopian goal of back to Africa was nothing more than a pipe dream from the start, or alternatively, 
one of the greatest Africans to ever live, setting the blueprint for a movement which set off a chain reaction that was reverberated throughout history, the master plan to lead Africans back to their promised land. Is he really proverbially, or literally as some would say, the Black Moses? Please let us know in the chat, I'd love to know your thoughts. If you aren't accustomed to how we do things here at the center, we try to stay engaged with you in the chat as much as possible. So we like our speakers to feel the pulse of our viewers to as much a degree as is feasible. It's just our way to make the gathering a little less virtual and it also encourages peer learning as well. And of course, you're welcome to stay on camera so that our speaker can see you. Just please stay on mute until the Q&A, which will be after about 30 to 35 minutes of presentation and then 15 to 20 minutes of conversation between our speaker and myself. So if we just head over to have a look at the chat, oh, we've got any comments so far? So Pekia said, an untouchable orator, an unmatched visionary. Thank you so much for that. Nigel, I'm not sure about the Black Moses, but I am sure he's one of the most important Africans to have lived in contemporary times, absolutely. Uh, Jason has said the latter, one of the greatest Africans in recent history, certainly within the 20th century. Thank you so much for that. Okay, so we've got a few comments to start with. Obviously there is a section for the Q&A after the presentation and then my conversation with the speaker. We've also got from Pearl, a political visionary and organizational genius. Thank you so much. So please keep the comments flowing. Uh, and as you continue to do that, I do want to turn our attention to tonight's guest. I know that Nigel is absolutely beside himself with excitement at having a scholar on the platform who grew up in the same town as him, which is Luton. It's a real pleasure to have Colin Grant with us for the next couple of hours. Every week, we are so privileged to be in the company of some of the most of some of the best intellectuals from around the world. And we're so grateful to our friends at the Institute of Pan-African Thought and Conversation for helping us make that happen. Colin is an Associate Fellow of the Centre of Caribbean Studies at the University of Warwick in the UK. He writes for The Guardian, The Observer, The New Statesman, The Times Literary Supplement and The New York Review of Books. He's the author of five books, including Negro with a Hat, The Rise and Fall of Marcus Garvey, a group biography of the Whalers called I and I, The Natural Mystics, and his latest work, Homecoming Voices of the Windrush Generation. That book was actually selected as the BBC Radio 4 Book of the Week and a Daily Telegraph Book of the Year in 2019. And also his memoir, Bag Eye at the Wheel, which was shortlisted for the Penn Ackley Prize in 2013. Grant's History of Epilepsy, A Smell of Burning, was a Sunday Times Book of the Year in 2016. Colin is a radio producer for the BBC, writing and directing several drama documentaries, including A Fountain of Tears, The Murder of Federico Garcia Lorca, and A History of the N-Word, which I've queued up to actually listen to later. He's also the newly appointed director of an exciting new organization called The Writer's Mosaic, an online platform for new writing from a mosaic of literary voices and cultures from across the UK that aims to be surprising, magical and moving. So without further delay, the man that's going to help us answer the question, was Marcus Garvey the Black Moses? Ladies and gentlemen, I hand you over to our speaker for the evening, Colin Grant. Thank you very much, Akate. And Welcome everybody. I would like to say a special welcome to my sister Sonia, who's uh, also in Brighton, and to Ade, whom I last saw in Johannesburg a few years ago. And I'm very pleased to be part of this great book, The Pan-African Pantheon. I'm going to share some images as we go along, so I'll share the screen now. So my parents are Jamaican. Uh, I was brought up in the same town as Nigel, Luton. I was born in Hitchin, not very far away. And all through my life, I never heard much about Garvey when I was growing up. Um, it wasn't really- Hello. I went Hello. to Jamaica. Hello. As a young Hello. man with my mother, uh, maybe 20 years ago or so, uh, that I saw Garvey lit large in the imagination of people because Again and again, as you walked around Kingston, the capital of Jamaica, 
especially in some of the impoverished areas, you see graffiti on the walls. And that graffiti was of this man, Marcus Messiah Garvey. And I was struck by the fact that he was better known in Jamaica than he was in England. And that's because I think he, as Akaite has explained, he inspired both adoration and hatred. For his followers, there was God and there was Garvey. But for many of his detractors, he was an imbecile, a fool, a disgrace to the race. But I think the problem that Garvey suffered after his death was that the story of Marcus Garvey was written from the point of view of his enemies. And it's my great desire to kind of rescue him from them and to change the narrative. Because in the course of writing my book on Garvey, Negro with a Hat, which I composed about 12 years ago, actually, and I was determined to give Garvey the same kind of treatment as W.E.B. Du Bois, <laughs> who had a two <coughs> biography of him written um, maybe 20 years ago or so, both won the Pulitzer Prize. So I was going to give Garvey the Du Bois treatment and give him that kind of um, serious, rigorous interrogation. My parents are Jamaican, as I said, and in Jamaica, you might have heard this phrase, it is often said, there are no facts, there are only versions. Now, whilst I might dispute the first part of that sentence, I'd say that the second is true. There are versions of the facts. And we've had many versions of Garvey, which I think have distorted the picture of him. And I was struck when I first began to research Garvey, how so sometimes people missed out the drama of the man. I was going to unite the drama of the individual, his personal story with his political story, because he was a visionary. Um, whether he was a Moses or not, we can debate, but he certainly had great ideas and he was going to restore the dignity of black people wherever they were around the world to themselves. In the course of this presentation, I'm gonna give a few short readings. And I'm gonna start with a reading, which is from the very beginning of my book, um, Negro with a Hat, which may excite people. I mean, the title is, is something that maybe we could interrogate later on because uh, I hope you're not offended by the word Negro. That's the word that Garvey embraced. And the book is historically specific, but some people are, are upset about that word. Okay, this is the prologue. It's called A Premature Death. At the end of 1940, May 1940, Marcus Garvey sat cold and forgotten in a tall drafty rented house at 53 Tilegraph Road in West Kensington, London. Recovering from a stroke, which had left him partially paralyzed, he was sorting through the newspapers that his secretary, Daisy White, had placed beside his bed when he came across a headline which he knew could not be true. Marcus Garvey dies in London. He scanned the other papers, some of which also carried notices of his death. They were not kind obituaries. It took almost a week for many of these papers to issue corrections. By then, wakes and memorials had been held for Marcus Garvey in the Caribbean and in the United States. Garvey found himself eulogized by a number of people whom he'd considered enemies and vilified by others who had not forgiven him for his alleged exploitation of black people. Miss White, his secretary, tried to shield her boss from some of the more uncharitable news stories, but he insisted on seeing them all. Garvey was still weak from the stroke, but more than that, the distress and embarrassment of his disability, he was deeply upset by his public and private impotence, by his inability to arrest the decline of his mass movement and by his estrangement from his family two years Previously, his wife had left him and returned to Jamaica with their children. He hadn't seen them since. Even if he'd been physically able to travel, there were few transatlantic passenger ships prepared to risk being sunk by the German U-boats patrolling the high seas. Marcus Garvey now faced clippings of himself and his obituary and pictures of himself with deep black borders, wrote his secretary. And after the second day of this pile of shocking correspondence. Reading this shocking correspondence, he collapsed in his chair. 
Reading the damning accounts written by former friends and enemies, Garvey has suffered another massive stroke. He died two weeks later on the 10th of June, 1940. It's my opinion that his obituaries killed him. In those last weeks of his life, Garvey must have been caught off guard by the surprisingly balanced coverage of papers such as the New York Times, the Daily Worker, and the Chicago Defender. Back in the 1920s, the Chicago Defender had had a pack of Negro papers in shrilly denouncing Garvey as a menace and a disgrace to the black race. Now on the 22nd of June, 1940, the Defender wrote, endowed with a dynamic personality, with unmatched oratorical gift, Garvey was easily the most colorful figure to have appeared in America since Frederick Douglass and Booker T. Washington. From 1914 to 1921, he dominated the scene with the powerful Universal Negro Improvement Association. Had Garvey succeeded in his undertakings, he would have been incontestably the greatest figure of the 20th century. Having failed, he's considered a fool. Now, I don't consider him a fool at all. And it's interesting to hear him being described as the greatest African. I'd say he's one of the greatest human beings of the 20th century. Um, and I wanted to get into that argument that people have about Garvey when I even began to think about the title of my book. The title actually was inspired um, by an image that I saw when I went to an exhibition in, London, in Brighton where I lived with my children. It was an exhibition called um, Make Life Beautiful, the dandy in history. And as I wandered around the gallery with my two children who were then 12 and eight, uh, it was full of the usual suspects. There was Noel Carroll, Cecil B. DeMille, um, and about halfway around, I came across this photograph um, of an unknown man and the caption said, Negro with hat. It was taken by a photographer called F. Holland Day. And beside this photograph was another photograph taken by the same photographer of a white man wearing a strange hat. And that caption was man with hat. And I remember uh, our eyes going from one picture to the other, my children and my eyes going from one picture to the other thinking, hold on, Negro with hat, man with hat, Negro with hat, man. so is a Negro not a man? And I got quite incensed on my children's behalf and I wrote, to the curator and um, then phoned him up and argued with him and said they should um, change the title. And he said, no, no, it's historically specific. And I said, okay, so the photographer called it Negro with hat. If the photographer had called it nigger with hat, would you have included it? It's a rather naughty question, a nasty question maybe on my part. And eventually the curator reached a compromise with me. He said that they would, uh, include the title Negro with Hat, but they put underneath that title original caption. But when I came to think about writing my own book, I thought that was actually a brilliant title for the book because Garvey was a man who always dressed beyond distinction. He saw wearing a hat as a mark of civility, a mark of erudition, and he was going to embrace those tropes, those clothes, those uniforms that were formerly associated with great statesmen, white statesmen in Europe and America, and he was going to adopt them for himself. But equally, there were people who saw Marcus Garvey in his Victorian military regalia and thought he was a buffoon. So even before you opened the book, Negro with Hat, Negro with a Hat, I thought there would be a debate that could be started. One of the great things about Marcus Garvey is that he had no formal education. He educated himself. If he were to grow up in the Caribbean at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, all of your education came from Britain. Um, there was no local produced literature. All of the literature was imported from Britain. My parents are Jamaican. When they grew up themselves, they were given Shelley, Keats, Wordsworth, all the romantic poets to read, Rudyard Kipling. Um, when I was growing up in Luton in the 60s, on a Saturday morning when my mother was cleaning the house, 
She'd often be reciting Gunga Ding by Kipling. She knew it verbatim. When people went to the cinema in the 30s and 40s in Jamaica, before the film began, they would stand up to sing the British National Anthem. And at the end of the screening, they would stand up to sing the British National Anthem. So people were very Anglophilic. Their eyes were turned towards Britain. Everything was seen through the prism of Britain. And actually, at that time, people were embarrassed by the notion of Africa. They only thought about Africa when the collection plate came round on a Sunday in church. So there was this great desire to push Africa to one side, to push enslavement to one side, and to think of yourself as new people who weren't African. There were these new people in the Caribbean. There were new Negroes, there were new black people. Garvey and this woman here, this is Amy Ashwood, who became his first wife, they educated themselves and they went to debating societies. In a way, Garvey's great rise could not have been achieved without the benefit of people like Amy Ashwood, who herself was a great orator. Um, she was 10 years younger than him when they met, um, but she schooled him in how to speak in a way that was emotionally intelligent and direct. And I think he learned from her. And he also learned about the nature of show business, about the nature of putting on a show, putting on a performance and attracting people's attention, which is very important to him when he became uh, successful <laughs> later on. Yeah, now, Garvey's great chance came when he left Jamaica and came to Harlem in New York in 1916. And he came at, at a very fortuitous time because it was an unseasonably warm time. And it was at the beginning of what was called the ebony orators, the street orators who would gather at Speaker's Corner in Harlem on 135th Street and 7th Avenue. And Garvey gave these great speeches. He, he learned very quickly it should be said that actually back in Jamaica, he'd often um, taken elocution lessons. Often people think that Garvey sounded like a country boy, but actually he educated himself out of the country. More or less, Garvey would have sounded a bit like, more, like me rather than someone who hadn't had the benefits of leaving his small place and, and forging a new identity through coming into contact with people who read, who, people who celebrated literature, who celebrated education. And he had a voice like thunder. He had a voice like God. It was said that when Garvey got up to speak, he could be heard from five blocks away. Um, but it wasn't just that he spoke powerfully. It was what he was saying. Because uh, Garvey was saying things that touched people. And when people heard him speak with his speaky-spoky Caribbean voice, they thought they were hearing their own voices. Now, I include this picture here. This is a picture of John E. Bruce, uh, Bruce Grit, who uh, in the beginning was a doubter, and there were many doubters about Garvey. Uh, the other thing to say about Garvey is that he came at a time in 1916 in America where people were under the heel of the white man still, but Harlem in New York was a great Negro metropolis. Three-fifths of the people who lived in Harlem at the time had been born in and around Manhattan. One-fifth of the people had migrated from the South in the Great Migration. And one-fifth of the people in Harlem, in New York, when Garvey was there, were from the Caribbean. And it was often said that these great Caribbean people had chutzpah. When any Caribbean person got 10 cents above poverty, they started a business. But there's great suspicion of them. But also there's great suspicion of Garvey because he wasn't educated, he educated himself. He wasn't tertiary educated like some of the other people who were the leaders of black America, of African America at that time. And Johnny Bruce was a skeptic. I'm gonna give another short reading here. He was this very tough journalist who'd um, made a living for himself by being a freelance journalist and going where the stories led him but never biting his tongue, never softening what he had to say. This is from a chapter called Harlem Speaks for Scattered Ethiopia. 
A tall, angular man stood at the back of the crowds on a street corner at the heart of Harlem. He wasn't one of the spies Marcus Garvey constantly warned his followers to beware. He wasn't employed by the Bureau of Investigation or military intelligence. He had attended Garvey rallies before. Then, as now, he remained aloof and skeptical. But on the evening of the 13th of October, 1919, as the autumn leaves began to fall from the towering poplars that lined 135th Street, so too did John E. Bruce's suspicion about the spectacular Jamaican start to recede. For as Bruce wrote in his memoirs, he had listened to the Ciceronian orator at numerous events in church halls and at Harlem's Speaker's Corner, but on this occasion he heard Garvey, perhaps for the first time, and it was as if the whole of Harlem was speaking with one voice. He'd listened and listened until he got a line on Garvey, ultimately on his honesty and tremendous earnestness that would not break. And thereafter, this man was a stalwart in Garvey's camp, as were many people. I think that was the great charm of Garvey was his voice and his ability to imagine the pain and suffering of people who listened to him and to couch it in terms which they understood. And as Johnny Bruce writes there, they felt they were hearing themselves. They're hearing their better selves. In a way, it's often said that one of the great things that Garvey did was that he sold the black man to himself. He gave him a better understanding of himself at a time when he was at the footstool of the world. Um, so he empowered people. It gave them a sense of self-love rather than self-loathing. And not only did he clothe himself in the uniforms of authority, he encouraged his followers to do so. And this is a family, this is the Garviat family. And here they are showing their best face, their, what the Italians would say, bella figura. And I think Garvey must have been an amazing man. Um, many of you I'm sure will have read Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. And there's a moment in that book when there's a discussion about Garvey. And one of the characters said, Garvey must have had something. Black people are hell to move. Garvey must have had plenty. And it's true. There are many doubters, there are many people who turned against each other. There was a lot of infighting. There was no great unity. Um, because also this is a time of the ascendancy of people like W.E.B. Du Bois, who led what was called the Talented Tenth. And these were tertiary educated, fair-skinned, brown Americans who were gonna lead the 10% of the population who were gonna integrate and change things for the majority, 90% who had followed them. And they were a top-down organization and Garvey was a bottom-up organization. Uh, his detractors and the people in the NAACP, uh, one of the organizations that uh, Du Bois was very prominent in, said that he led the Cowtail and Brune Handel Brigade. They are very disparaging. And whereas Garvey's followers might call the NAACP the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, they might say they were the National Association for the Advancement of Certain People, Equally, they would turn the tables on Garvey's followers and say that the UNIA wasn't the Universal Negro Improvement Association. It was the ugliest Negroes in America. That was the kind of animosity that Garvey found himself in. And so that was the kind of challenge that he had. And the challenge was to turn the narrative, to change things around. And he did so, especially through his oratory and his organization. Um, one of the key moments which I'm sure we'll talk about later, is, is the moment when he decided, as his followers grew, as his numbers grew, to um, have, to hold the first international conference of the Negro peoples of the world. And he marched 25,000 of his followers down from Harlem to Madison Square Garden. There were hundreds of choirs, the men in these military uniforms, there were people with banners and flags. There was great excitement. There were jazz bands. There was uh, photographers who took these photographs. There were film crews. There were people recording the speeches. Um, and there was this great sense that this is the moment. People wanted to be aligned to this man. 
because he seemed to have this energy, this chutzpah, this charisma, this chance to build a new Negro, a new sense of people who weren't going to be characterized in the way that they were before. Um, now, this is a conference where Marcus Messiah Garvey was elected the provisional president of Africa. He was elected by delegates, but I don't think he had any endorsement from any African. He rather arrogant idea that he could become the whole leader of Africa. Um, there were 98 delegates who elected him the provisional president of Africa, but he also rewarded some of his followers, some of his lieutenants with grand titles. There was uh, the Baron of the Zambezi, there was the Duke of the Nile. And what Garvey and his followers were doing, they were embracing the same ways that the imperial powers honored and rewarded their greatest achievers. And they wore the same kind of uniforms. And Garvey would say, well, if the Pope can wear a red gown, why can't I wear Victorian military regalia? And he's also modeled himself on the Irish. So around about the same time, about the year before, Eamon de Valera pronounced himself the provisional president of Ireland. And they looked to Sinn Féin, ourselves alone is the translation. And they said, we will do the same for the black man. And at that conference, there were many declarations made including from now on, people would no longer answer to the word nigger, lowercase n. They would only answer to the word Negro, uppercase n. And they'd mounted a campaign to try to get the newspapers to fall in line. It took the New York Times another 10 years or so before they did, but that was their ambition. And they also recognized, Garvey recognized that, um, that black people had no sense of unity there were only two countries in Africa that hadn't been colonized by the European powers. There's Ethiopia and Liberia. And there's a very horrible race song. They call them coon songs. That was doing the rounds about the time called every nation has a flag except the Negro. So Garvey was gonna give them their own flag. Garvey was gonna rally people and say, we will form a new empire of our own and we won't be governed by the white man anytime soon. And the way that he ultimately did that was to start businesses. And the, the, the great success that Garvey achieved was a shipping line uh, called the Black Star Line. And this is a picture of the first ship, uh, the Yarmouth. And this is a postcard. You might see at the bottom here, the Yarmouth owned and manned by colored men. And um, to the side on, on the top right hand corner, you see a, a photograph of Captain Coburn, Joshua Coburn. He was the captain of the Yarmouth. Uh, he was the man that Garvey looked to in order to buy ships. Um, but what Garvey didn't realize uh, was that Coburn was working both sides of the street. So he was working both for the vendor and for the seller, and he'd get a kickback for many, any sale that he managed. So it's in his interest to up the price of the ships that they bought. And they, they spent far too much money on these ships, which are overpriced, and these ships were leaky uh, vessels that, that uh, didn't do very well when it came to trading. But what they did was they, they cemented this idea of, yes, you can. This is a time of, of imperial power when people in other countries exhibit their grandeur, exhibit their ambition through building and owning ships. That's what the big European allies did, the big European empires did, and Garvey did the same. And um, on the 31st of October, uh, 1919, um, when this first ship, the Yarmouth was unveiled, Garvey wrote, the internal has happened. The eternal has happened. For centuries, the black man has been taught by his ancient overlords that he was nothing, is nothing, and never shall be anything. Five years ago, the Negro was sleeping on his bale of cotton. 
in the south of America. He was steeped in mud in the banana fields of the West Indies and Central America, seeing no possible way for extricating himself from the environments he smarted under the lash of the new taskmaster in Africa. But alas, today he's a new man. That's what Garvey was suggesting. This is a turning point. Uh, this is a change in people's fortunes. And such is the excitement that people rush to buy shares. If you had $5, you could buy shares in the Black Star Line. And this is a photograph of the wonderful Mariam Samad, who I interviewed for my book. And she talked about the fact, she was about 90 when I met her 10 years or so ago. She talked about the fact that her father, who was a bodyguard for Garvey, when they heard about the policy of buying shares, they might've been poor, they might've been hungry. Her father would go out with money to buy food and he'd come back with certificates for the Black Star Line. People weren't just investing in order to make money, they were investing in an idea of a better future for the entire race. That's how they saw it. And I think Garvey saw that there was a possibility to forge an idea, a unifying idea through the shipping line, which would trade between the Americas, the Caribbean, uh, Europe and Africa, but also eventually these ships on the Black Star Line would be able to take people back to home, back to Africa. And that's why he forged a relationship with uh, the librarians. This is Du Bois, this is W.E. Du Bois, uh, his nemesis. I think that the, the trick, the, the real difficulty um, and the real shame of the relationship between Garvey and Du Bois was that there was no relationship. I mean, Du Bois uh, led this uh, interracial organization, the NAACP, and he was the editor of the Crisis Magazine. And they were down on 70th Street in, uh, in New York. And Garvey was up on 125th and 135th Street. So they didn't physically meet, but there was one opportunity in 1923, um, there was a moment in, in Cincinnati, a very short reading here for you. On his way to breakfast at 10 o'clock at the Sheraton Hotel in Cincinnati, this is 24, 1924, May 1924, Du Bois, the foremost scholarly black man of his day and exemplary critic of Garvey, stood waiting with his host, Professor Wendell Phillips Dabney, by the elevator that would take them to the restaurant. With a ping, the door suddenly opened and out stepped a group of splendidly costumed black ladies who formed a guard of honor, a phalanx around a stout, dark gentleman, gorgeously apparelled in military costume. Ye gods, exclaimed Dabney in a later account. Twas Garvey. He saw me, a smile of recognition, then a glance at Du Bois. His eyes flew wide open. Stepping aside, he stared. Turning around, he stared. While Du Bois, looking straight ahead, head uplifted and nostrils quivering, marched into the elevator. The two men never spoke. The doors closed comfortably and the editor of the crisis having pretended not to see his rival, ascended. Du Bois and Garvey meet, screamed the headlines in the Cincinnati Union the next day. No blood is shed. So there you have it, no blood is shed. That was the strength of the animosity between the two. And it also deepened, that animosity deepened when Garvey and his team tried to buy land in Monrovia. Um, by land from the Liberian authorities. And they, um, they thought they had it in with uh, a relative of uh, President King, this is President King. Um, but what they didn't realize is that they were being strung along. They were never gonna get that land. And in the end, the land went to the, the Firestone Rubber Company, at least at, you know, five cents uh, an acre or some ridiculous amount of money. So Garvey was up against it, not just from the FBI or the Bureau of Investigation as it was then called, up against the European military regalia, the European military powers, 
He was up against Du Bois. He was up against those African Americans who hated him, who led a campaign that said Garvey must go. And he was up against it with the Liberian authorities who spurned his uh, overtures and took his money and rewarded him with nothing in the end. And it's a great tragedy, I think. It was a great moment that could have yielded something. It was also uh, problematic when it came to his relationship with um, Haile Selassie, which we can talk about perhaps in, in our chat because I realize we're coming to, to a, an end of my presentation here. But yeah, he didn't do himself any favors when he turned against Selassie. And we can talk about why that happened. But ultimately, I thank uh, Garvey's wives. Uh, I thank one or two scholars who kept his name going. And I thank the Rastas. <laughs> Here we are, the guy in the middle, you might recognize uh, at the time, uh, these young men were called the teenagers, the uh, Rhythm and Blues outfit. They became the Whalers. There's uh, Bunny Whaler, Bob Marley in the middle, and Peter Tosh. And so they transformed themselves in 10 years from these uh, Brill Cream zoot suited R&B singers into uh, Rastafarians uh, wearing battle taken with uh, flaying, flying dreadlocks. Uh, there's uh, Bob, Brother Bob uh, at the One Love Peace concert in 1978. Um, and in the course of researching my book on, on Garvey, um, I came across a line which I thought was extraordinary. Um, and I'm not going to sting you the line, but the line is this. Uh, we must emancipate ourselves from mental slavery because whilst others might free the body, none of ourselves can free the mind. And many people will know that's a line from Bob Marley's song, Redemption Song. But uh -uh, that line is from Marcus Messiah Garvey, in 1930. One, Menlik Hall, Nova Scotia. Uh, but Brother Bob read Marcus Garvey and Brother Bob and many Rastafarians and many reggae singers fed Garvey into their lyrics. So oftentimes, whether you realize it or not, when you're dancing to Bob Marley, you're actually dancing to Marcus Messiah Garvey. Thank you very much.